This program is brought to you by Emory University. All right, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning. Um, I met Dr. Yoav Dori, I believe, about four years ago at a conference in Michigan. And I was one of a number of speakers talking about circulatory dysfunction in Fontan patients. And he got up after me and, and said, I've heard all these great talks, but no one has once mentioned the lymphatic system. So that got me thinking, wow, that's a pretty big oversight. So he's going to rectify that for the rest of my career here. Um, he is uh, director of the Center for Lymphatic Imaging and Interventions at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He received his PhD in chemical engineering at the University of Minnesota and graduated medical school at Johns Hopkins University where he stayed on for pediatric and pediatric cardiology training. He then went on to CHOP to study uh, interventional cardiology and MRI imaging. He has received numerous awards, published many papers on the innovative work he's done in lymphatic imaging and interventions, and his work has helped elucidate the ideology of uh, a number of issues with lymphatic system in circulatory dysfunction, such as heart failure, Fontan patients, et cetera. And he has developed some very novel interventions, and I think you will enjoy his talk. Uh, as much as I will. So join me in welcoming Dr. Dory. All right, thank you everybody and welcome. And thank you for having me. And uh, I always love those introductions. <laughs> Doesn't sound like me. I mean, Neil knows me. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> nothing like that, is it, Neil? <laughs> All right, so we'll, we'll talk today about, I know a lot of you are, uh, uh, adult cardiologist, um, uh, and we are now starting to uh, deal with a, a lot of adult patients with heart failure and stuff like that. So you will have to deal with the limb system also at some point. And uh, we'll give you an introduction. I'll show you a lot of the stuff that we do on the congenital side and start to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that goes on uh, on your side. <clears throat> My only disclosure is that probably most of what I'm going to talk about today is going to be wrong. And uh, we have been in denial, and I definitely, about this circulatory system. We have all learned about the cardiovascular system, and even uh, where Neil and I went to medical school together, the amount of time that we spent learning about this circulatory system was quite minimal. Uh, usually medical schools spend about 20 minutes on the circulatory side of this and talk about all the other functions of the lymphatic system. And you all probably are the same. I mean, on a day-to-day basis, you're probably not talking about lymph circulation, lymph dysfunction, although you're dealing with it all the time, especially adult, uh, people are dealing with adults with heart failure, right? This, uh, fluid overload is one of the biggest problems that you deal with. Lymph physiology and lymphatic system was studied extensively until the, in the, uh, 40 years ago and 50 years ago, and we're actually one of our colleagues uh, was one of the original lymphologists, but then the whole uh, field kind of went dormant and went away. And the reason for that is that there was no easy way to look at it, there was nothing to do about it, so the best thing to do, I guess, was just to ignore it. But I'm happy to say that we're back now, and we're definitely back. And lymph system has multiple functions. And if you start to look at the literature, you'll see that the articles are now coming out about the function of this uh, circulatory system. We all know the defense role, and especially as pediatricians, right? You go to a doctor, they always palpate those lymph nodes, and if they're big, oh my god. Uh, but there's other uh, immune and defense functions that the system plays. There's a very important transport role, and as adult uh, <coughs> um, uh, heart failure or adult doctors dealing with coronary artery disease, this function of the system is, is a big thing because all the, the chylomicrons and the init initiation of that cycle starts in the intestine and the lymph system is responsible for absorbing all of that. And then there's the circulatory function, right? So if excess fluid from the tissue is returned to the venous system through this uh, lymphatic circulation. This system also plays a role in many other disease processes. And unfortunately for us, or fortunately for me, a lot of those we just don't know. It plays a role definitely in a lot of lung problems, rheumatoid arthritis, cancers, right? We all know that cancers metastasize through the lymphatic duct. 
The question is why are they always going there? Why can't we always find them in lymph nodes? Why are they not traveling in other places? And actually we have some new data, which we won't talk about too much today, to show maybe why that happens. As I said, there's many articles now coming out, uh, and I suspect that the volume of these will increase about the role that this is playing in some of the diseases that you are all treating, right? So one is myocardial infarction and atherosclerosis, right? So as I said, fats are uh, exclusively uh, <coughs> mobilized through the lymphatic duct. And there is data now to show that these uh, HDL particles and LDL particles are moving uh, in plaques through the lymphatic duct. And the uh, article that is shown over here, this, was, this just came out in Nature, uh, and this was done in uh, mice, uh, but showing that if you induce lymphangiogenesis in areas that were infarcted, then the uh, region of scar will be diminished. And the reason for that, right, is that part of the scar formation when you have myocardial infarction is edema and inflammation. And again, lymphatic system is responsible for modulating or uh, uh, taking care of that. There is old data about uh, uh, other roles that the limb system plays in, uh, in the cardiac world. And it was interesting, I was in the World Congress of Lymphology uh, a couple of years ago, and I was sitting with an old uh, Japanese researcher, his name is Okada, and he was talking about the lymph system as it relates to the conduction system. And even a long time ago, they knew that if you have lymph dysfunction, it will lead to arrhythmias. And they published that, and if you have lymph dysfunction, you can also lead to degeneration and dysfunction of your valves. Uh, and all of these are important because all our patients with heart failure ultimately develop these things, and a lot of times we don't exactly understand why they're developing arrhythmias, right? And maybe it's because we haven't looked exactly in the right location. This is an article that just came, it was in Jack. It was a single case report of a adult heart failure patient who presented with uh, intractable ventricular tachycardia. And when they initially did the T2 imaging on this patient, you can see that there was this region over here, very bright in T2, corresponded to scarring, and that corresponded, the, the, the patient ultimately had to get a heart transplant because of that, but that region uh, that they saw by imaging corresponded to these things over here, and this is uh, large lymphatic channels. So uh, something was wrong in that region of the heart that led to these uh, very bad arrhythmias that ultimately needed that. <clears throat> so if we're talking about lymph system, then we have to understand a little bit about how this works and a little bit about the physiology. So we'll spend some time uh, going through that. And then I'll show you some of the diseases that we're dealing with lymphatic flow disorders. This is my schematic of what uh, generally what lymphatic flow looks like. So the flow is from the different organs, from peripherally, centrally. Main channel for lymphatic drainage is the thoracic duct. Right? And most people, the thoracic duct goes up and drains to the innominate vein or the junction of the subclavian and the innominate and the IJ on the left side. Although there is a lot of variability in this anatomy, it's more like a fingerprint. It's not exactly a fixed uh, anatomy. Two very important uh, organs, and especially in heart failure. So all of you who are dealing with people with heart failure, which is uh, <clears throat> everyone here, the liver is one of the biggest problems. And uh, liver lymphatic flow is a huge problem in these patients. And uh, our understanding of this will need to increase to better understand what is happening to these patients. There's many different compositions to lymph fluid. You usually talk about lymphatic leaks in the context of chylothorax, right, or chylosocieties, or chylish things. Chylomicrons are absorbed, as I told you before, from the intestines and exclusively from the intestines. So if you have a leak that is white, and you probably all have seen that in adults, either after surgery or, uh, <coughs> or spontaneously, uh, that only means that the stream that is connected to whatever is leaking is coming from the intestine. Right? because that's the only source of chylomicrons. But you can have leaks in lymphatic system, and we've dealt with a lot of those, who have nothing to do with chyl fluid. They can have leaks that are coming from the liver. There's no chyl in there, but they are lymphatic leaks uh, in origin. And there was one person, actually, there's even a patent about it, who thought, right, because in principle, if you take this stream that's coming from the intestine and you divert it, right, then you can eat whatever you want. You'll never get fat, right, because all the fats are absorbed directly through there. And uh, there was one patent and one person that we actually knew who thought about connecting the intestine directly to the kidneys and by that just bypassing the whole thing. So then you would basically just pee out all the fat that you eat. Not the best way probably to do it, uh, but you could do it. 
Uh, liver releases a lot of protein, and then there's a lot of the inflammatory cells that are running through this system uh, that are responsible. All the T cells, this is where they come from, right? So it's a lot of the inflammatory process. The physiology of the lymph system is uh, uh, very different than the cardiovascular system, right? The cardiovascular side, we're flowing about three to four liters a minute per meter squared. And the lymph system in normal people is about two to three liters a day going through the thoracic duct. Uh, there's a lot of lymph flow, it's about eight liters a day, then, so a lot of it is not going through the central thoracic duct. It's making its way to veins and other places. Pressures and the physiology of the system is not well understood in humans. There have been a lot of studies done in, uh, in animals. We have now started to do that kind of, those kind of measurements, so hemodynamic measurements or lymphodynamic measurements in humans, and I'll show you a little bit about what that looks like. Composition is a little bit different, and the way the fluid is pumped is different, right? There's no lymphatic pump in humans. There are some animals, old animals, that have a, a lymphatic pump in there, but that kind of went away, and thus, although <laughs> there are many pumps inside the lymphatic ducts, and I'll show you what those look like in, in a second also. Starling, 100 years ago, derived the equation for tissue fluid formation. So this equation, you are dealing with all the time, right? Because you're dealing with patients who are constantly coming in, CHF, fluid overload, right? And you're trying to reverse this equation, right? To get them to a point where they, instead of spilling fluid into the tissue, they're getting it out of the tissue, right? And that becomes harder and harder to do as they get older and older, right? This equation, anyhow, at baseline is okay, but it's missing, right? It's not a complete equation because tissue fluid formation is related also to lymphatic dysfunction, right? And that shows nowhere up in this uh, Starling equation. But it's overall a pretty good equation. It tells you that the difference between hydrostatic and oncotic pressure uh, is the rate of uh, tissue fluid formation. Lymph system exists everywhere. Lymph channels exist everywhere where there's a capillary bed. Okay, so they all go together. The lymph capillaries or lymphangions are a little bit different, right? Because the capillaries are not as porous. You can think about the lymph system as this sponge, right? Its job is to absorb all this fluid. So there's these open <coughs> channels uh, connected with microtubules. So when tissue swells, the cells actually get pulled apart and the channels open, and then more fluid can rush in there. This is the pumping mechanism, or part of the pumping mechanism, and the distal lymph channels are pulsating, and they pump, and there's muscles in the walls, right? And this is what one of those looks like. This is images from the Mayo Clinic. But if you have a, a, <coughs> a system of pumping channels, and you need fluid to go forward, right, unless there's coordination between how things are pumping, which we don't know if it's exactly all coordinated, it doesn't seem like, then you need something to make the fluid go forward, so there's valves everywhere. Right? And these valves need to function for the system to function. This is uh, what a lymphatic capillaries look like. These are the valves. This is a human. So this is a patient, obviously, with heart failure because the thoracic duct is very dilated. But you can see over here, over here, and over here, these are the lymphatic valves. Okay? So they exist. We see them all the time. <laughs> So there's rhythmic contraction, but in addition to that, there's several other pumps in the system. There's a respiratory pump, and then there's the thought that every time you walk, right, your muscles are pressing against these lymphatic channels, and there's even a thought that the aorta, which sits right next to the thoracic duct, maybe when it's pulsating, pushes on the thoracic duct and gets the fluid to move forward. At the terminus of the thoracic duct, there's a valve. Right? And this valve uh, is important, and in many ways that we don't, I think, completely understand, because what we do see is that at some point, this valve does become dysfunctional in all patients with heart failure. And that was shown nicely in an article by uh, Seeger. This is uh, the article. This is just ultrasound imaging of the thoracic duct outlet. This is normal. So this is your subclavian. You can see a valve in the vein, but this is the thoracic duct, and this is the valve right over here. Right? This is a patient of ours that we were imaging, and you can see this is the thoracic duct, and you can see the fluid going forward, but you'll see in a second that this valve has become completely incompetent. You can see the fluid is constantly refluxing. And when I say fluid is refluxing, right, this is blood, right? Blood refluxing into lymphatic ducts is a big problem because, first of all, it can cause clotting of the system. But in addition to that, what does that mean to the pressures and everything in there, right? And again, Every single one of your patients who has ascites and fluid overload is going to have a huge duct, and most likely their valves are completely dysfunctional. Right? And what does that mean as far as uh, the ability to get the fluid out of the tissue? Now, those are good questions, and I don't think we have fully understood all of this. 
As I said, we don't completely understand lymph flow dynamics, but what we do know is that lymphatic pressures seem to follow the venous pressure because that's the afterload on the system. But there are cases, so this is one Fontan patient. You can see that the duct is in red and the <coughs> venous pressure is in blue over here, and they're following each other, but intermittently the lymphatic pressure is a little bit higher, and that's when you inject fluid into the venous system. But here's a patient where the duct is in blue and the venous system is in red. So his pressure inside the thoracic duct is pulsatile and is the same as the aortic pressure. So how is that possible? And we did this measurement again and again and again, and that's what we saw. And in the context of some of the work that one of our collaborators, uh, collaborators uh, from Denmark has done, uh, this makes sense, at least for a short period of time, that they can do this, because the lymph channels can pump at about 60, 70 millimeters of mercury. But they probably can't do this forever, and ultimately that leads to failure of the system, right? Just like the cardiac system or anything else with muscle in the body that ultimately will fail. This is what, on average, and we've just started collecting all our data, we've now done lymphodynamics measurements in many, many, many patients. <clears throat> and on average, we do see that they follow the cardiac side, but there's many patients where the lymphatic pressure is higher, and there are many patients where the lymphatic pressure is, 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 is lower. And how can that happen? And what we have found is that most of those who have a lower pressure than the venous pressure is because they have very large channels connected to the pulmonary side, and that leads to all these leaks and stuff like that. And so their afterload is not really necessarily the venous side, it's, it's the pleural surface. And that's how they can get lower. The higher pressures, that's a very interesting problem, right? And that could signify that they have <clears throat> some kind of stenosis or some kind of narrowing in the pathways, but what does that ultimately mean as far as tissue fluid formation, right, where you have your lymphatic pressure higher than your venous pressure, right, in the capillaries? Interesting questions. So what affects lymph flow? Well, everything. Right? Everything that's going to affect the cardiovascular side is going to affect the lymphatic side, right? Everything that you're doing in the ICUs with your heart failure patients, you give them diuretics. Interestingly enough, I thought Lasix was great for lymph, right? I mean, Lasix is great for uh, removing fluid. Uh, but again, our collaborator in Denmark, Wendy Book, she takes lymphatic channels out of people, because she was a surgeon, and she plays with them. And she has shown that Lasix, at a certain dose, will completely paralyze lymphatic ducts. They will stop to pulsate. Uh, but it's excellent for removing fluid, right? So the interplay, we don't know what it does inside people, but our understanding of what all these medicines that we're giving are doing to these lymphatic channels is really limited. It's almost nothing, right? And yet we're giving them. And then there's many other things, and we won't go through all of them, but I'll show some of them <clears throat> because these will be important. As I said, medicine, right? Norepinephrine, this is pulsations of lymphatic ducts. In a dose-dependent matter, at a certain point, lymphatic channels will start to pulsate very quickly and will contract, right? So they respond to these kind of hormones. Increased pulmonary flow. This is a work that was done by a collaborator of ours. His name is Sanjeev uh, from UCSF. Uh, but this is an animal that had increased pulmonary blood flow. This is lymph channel in normal animal in the lungs. This is what happens when you have a lot of pulmonary flow that leads to pulmonary edema, right? So all your patients who have pulmonary edema, their lymphatic channels in the lungs are going to be engorged, right? And what does that mean again? CVP, so respiratory uh, <coughs> intrathoracic pressure, matters a lot, especially in babies, but also matters in adults, right? Because increase of PEEP or increased pressure or intrathoracic pressure affects two things. It increases CVP, increases <coughs> the uh, afterload on the lymphatic channels and also the preload on the liver, and that ultimately leads to lymph dysfunction, anasarcopely, and effusions. And this occurs in all the babies. It is also a target for uh, interventions. This is a baby who has no cardiac disease but has bad lung function, right? And uh, this baby was on a high peep of about 16. You can see the thoracic duct is dilated. It's tortuous. It looks like an adult heart failure duct, right? And the baby is supposed to be draining right over here. And you can see that there is nothing coming out of the thoracic duct in this baby. And contrary, it's going all up here into these networks that are going right into the head. And this child's head is enormous because of that, because all these liters of flow are going directly into the skin and the head. 
If you shut down the vent, turn off the peep, look right over here, and you'll see that the thoracic duct will start draining like crazy as soon as you do that, right? And pressure inside the thoracic duct when you do this will drop significantly. So when we play with vents now in our NICUs and, and places like that, we are looking at this. We titrate vents in our NICUs now based on lymph flow in some cases when kids are anasarcic and uh, edematous. CVP is extremely important, uh, <clears throat> and uh, all your patients with right-sided symptoms or right-sided heart failure, have, most of them have elevated CVP. Uh, and the reason for it is because, again, as I said, CVP is the afterload and the preload on the lymphatic uh, circulatory system. Now, if you look at our single ventricle patients, which is a very unique population, right, they're kind of unique because we load the lymph system in a stage-wise manner as we're going through their stage palliation. They're born, they're normal, right, their venous pressure is kind of normal, but then we make them into a glen. Right? So then we're increasing, increasing the afterload because now we've made their pressure here higher. Right? So we start to see lymphatic congestion even in babies who have higher afterload. But then when we make them into a fontan, so this is equivalent to your heart failure patients. right? So now you've kicked lymph production in the liver significantly and you have a bad afterload. This is a double hit on the system that ultimately leads to all kinds of crazy stuff happening and fluid starting to accumulate inside the tissue. But it's not just the abnormal physiology that we're seeing in our patients, and we're seeing it also in your patients now, right? In the adults, we start to see abnormal anatomy, and this abnormal anatomy that can lead to pulmonary edema and all kinds of other stuff is this abnormal flow in the lungs where the lymph channels, what happens to them, and we don't know when exactly it happens, but we think that some of them are born with it. Uh, some of it, this could potentially develop as they're going along, but the lymph channels in the lungs start to develop this retrograde flow. So instead of draining towards the ducts, things start to flow in the opposite direction. We call this pulmonary lymphatic perfusion. I'll show you some images later. And that can lead to uh, all kinds of findings. This is work uh, that has shown what happens when you increase afterload and preload. And this is animal work. But it's showing you that when you increase afterload, right, at a pressure of about 10 millimeters of mercury, you start to see a linear decline in lymph drainage, and absolutely yes, this is what we see in patients also. And we now have patients that we drain them, and uh, when we uh, increase the afterload on the drainage, lymph flow just completely stops. And this is what happens to the liver at about the same pressure. So all your patients with right-sided heart failure at a pressure of about 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury are going to have a huge increase in production of lymph fluid from their liver, and this is what it looks like. Marlies Witte, who is that person that I told you was our collaborator, okay, she was one of the original lymphologists, very interesting person, very interesting story. She actually grew up in New York and was very close friends with Bobby Fisher, and her husband used to swindle all the people in Colombia. They used to play chess uh, over there. Um, but understanding that lymph system is very important for fluid balance, her and her husband, which were, I call them the original lymphologists, uh, took patients in 1969 with severe congestive heart failure. They right? put them in a hospital. Back then you could do all kinds of stuff. You didn't need IRBs. And they put a plastic tube into their thoracic duct and they just drained them. Right? So this is what it looks like. And all their symptoms of heart failure just complete, went away and very quickly. You can drain fluid out of the body extremely quickly by doing this. Right? So they took the fluid, they put it into a bucket, right? And all the patients, and anasarca and all the edema and stuff like that goes away, right? This is before, this is after, and it goes away actually very quickly because you're just getting fluid out of the body. Central venous pressure goes down when you're doing that. Circulatory time gets better, so your circulation gets better, right? Because you're taking fluid out of a tissue. And think of it like an electrical circuit, right? If you have, if you have an electrical circuit that needs a ground to work, right? If you take away the ground, you're going to start to accumulate current, and then your flow of electrons is not going to work. And the same thing happens in fluid systems, right? Once you've put fluid everywhere, the system can't work efficiently. This is animals that had ascites that they did a study with where they bypassed the congestion. These were animals with right heart failure. Again, this was all done 40 years ago, way before, uh, not before I was born, unfortunately, but before I got into lymphatics. Uh, and if you drain the lymphatic system, ascites will go away. But this was internally draining them, right? This was not taking the fluid out and throwing it into a bucket. This was just taking the fluid from the thoracic duct and connecting it to a low pressure circuit, allowing the fluid to drain out. And yeah, edema in a 
ascites and all that kind of stuff will go away. And we've started doing this now in people, and I'll show you kind of what that looks like. As I said, people stopped looking at the system because we had no way to do anything and no way to look at it. But the most important thing for any organ in the body, if you want it to be a clinical organ, you need to be able to see it, right? Or test it or do something with it, right? And so that's what we started working on five years ago. And again, I got into lymphatics. It was all a mistake. Uh, but we, I was lucky because I met somebody in, uh, in uh, Philadelphia. We had an uh, interventional radiologist. His name was Constantine Cope. He unfortunately passed away not too long ago. But he was the original uh, person who said that you can get into the thoracic duct going through the stomach. And then we developed all kinds of minimally invasive methods to look at this. So uh, <clears throat> in the old days, people used to get into the lymphatic ducts. And I don't know if somebody ever, ever saw that using pedal lymphangiography. So you used to go digging between the toes to find this. It was a painful procedure, not just for the people that they used to have to cut their toes open, but for the people doing it, because it took so many hours to get the, th the, flu the, the contrast agent to the thoracic duct. And in a lot of cases, it just didn't work. So people just abandoned it. But I'm happy to say that intranodal lymphangiography has now replaced that. A very easy technique to do. Anybody can do that. And there are many other techniques that we're now working on. And we have now routinely do intrahepatic lymphangiography. And I'll show you some images of what that looks like. And that has opened a completely new world of what is going on over there. Because now, even in patients with heart failure, we can see what liver lymphatic flow looks like. Okay? And I'll show you what that looks like. This is normal uh, intranodal lymphangiography. This is just T2 imaging. So T2 just looks at water. And lymphatic channels have slow moving water. So T2 can actually show you a lot of stuff. Um, intranodal lymphangiography in a normal person kind of looks like this. So we're injecting MRI contrast agent in the nodes. And this is the thoracic duct as it's light up. So this technique has really opened the world for, lymph for looking at lymphatic flow disorders. Because if you're looking at them, right, just understanding anatomy, just like on the cardiovascular side, that's not enough. You need to be able to see flow, anatomy, and you need to be able to measure lymphodynamics to really start to understand what is going on in there. This is this intrahepatic lymphangiography. Okay? So we access the liver. We do this now in almost all patients with heart failure. <clears throat> it's been spectacular in showing us some of the diseases that are occurring in heart failure. But you can see that fluid goes from the liver to the retroperitoneal lymphatics, and then you can see that the thoracic duct lights up. Right? So this would be a normal kind of a study for intrahepatic lymphangiography. This is thoracic duct access. This is the transabdominal thoracic duct access. Uh, <clears throat> it's a very simple technique uh, to do. It takes a little practice because you have to go, especially in adults, because you have to go with really long needles. Uh, you put some lapidal. This is this oil contrast agent. And then you just go through the stomach with the needles uh, and then put a wire and then ultimately a catheter into the thoracic duct when you have a target. These are these oil targets. In patients with heart failure, you don't have these uh, oil droplets sitting over there. You'll see an oil droplet just running, and then you just stick. Uh, it works very well. So those are the techniques. That has been the initial technique that allow us to do a lot of the interventions. I'll show you today some of the other techniques that we have developed, but not all of them. I mean, it's impossible in an hour to go through everything. Looking at our single ventricle population, right? The good news about our single ventricle population, those were the population that we really started. That's why I got into lymphatics, because I had patients. Because Fontan patients are patients who just live with chronic right heart failure, right? That's their entire lifetime is that. And we had some patients with bad lymphatic dysfunction, plastic bronchitis, and I'll show you what that looks like. And that's how we started reading about it and getting interested in this, right? And but the good thing about these right heart failure patients that we have is that they live longer, but they all get sick, right? They all get uh, end organ dysfunction. And a lot of this we don't understand. And, we, and the reason why is because, again, we have looked maybe in the wrong location, right? Because their cardiovascular side, in a lot of cases, is doing fine. Their heart function is OK. But things fall apart in them. Wendy is the one who showed this and wrote this down. And this is the correct way to look at it. And I show this in any place I go. This is the way that you need to, uh, uh, to, 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 to the terminology for heart failure, not just in Fontan patients. Actually, this, character, this classification of heart failure needs to be extended into adults with heart failure, right? Because there is limb failure in adults with heart failure. That's when fluid accumulation is going to start to occur and become a big problem. The first ones are the ones that the cardiologists deal with. You know, this is the HEFPEF, HEFREF. 
Uh, but then there's these ones. One is limb failure, and that is protein losing enteropathy and plastic bronchitis. But then there is this one, right? It's normal function, but fluid accumulation. And I will say that this is also related to what the lymphatic system is doing and the interplay between the cardiovascular and the lymph system. And some insight into the fact that the cardiovascular side doesn't always explain what is happening to our heart failure patients, and this works again for your patients as well, right? Because in all your patients with severe CHF, liver dysfunction is not entirely explained by the degree of elevation of right-sided pressure, right? Patients with heart failure will get liver cirrhosis. And this is data that came out of our uh, <coughs> institute. And you can see there was zero correlation between venous pressure and the degree of liver fibrosis. So something else is going on there, right? And you know, right, that some of your patients will develop ascites, some of them won't. And some patients with relatively low venous pressure are developing ascites, and some patients with horrendous right-sided venous pressure have no ascites whatsoever, right? But what did pan out is that time from Fontan does explain how much degree of fibrosis, or time from right-sided heart failure does correlate with how much abnormalities they have in their liver. And this is a huge problem. And the reason for it, I think, is related to the lymph system, right? Because a long time ago, people knew this. Right? Anybody dealing with lymphedema knows that edematous wet tissue is going to be wet and is going to be fibrotic, right? And if you change lymph dysplasia with just lymphostasis, right, which everybody with right-sided elevated pressures is going to have, that will lead to a lymphedema and a cascade of events that will lead to fibrosis, inflammation, and lymphangiogenesis, right? So yes, this has to do with all the edema and myocardial infarctions. All the other edema that you're seeing is leading to this. This process is happening all the time in any wet tissue, right? So do we see lymphostasis in our patients? Yeah, we see them all the time. And if you look in your patients, you'll see it also, right? And some of the signs of lymphostasis is these abnormal channels that we see in the shoulder region, usually large collections. Uh, and you can see a thoracic duct over here that's enormous, it's dilated, it's tortuous. Any flexible tube, this again goes back to chemical engineering, it's an unstable state, right? If you look at the Navier-Stokes equations of any flexible tube that is under high pressure, it will tend to buckle. And that's exactly what's happening to the thoracic duct. And there's more going on actually over there. But what we see also see is in all of our single ventricle patients who have right-sided failure chronically is that overall their tissue is wetter, so they have edema. And you will see that if you do T2 imaging on your patients, you'll see that their tissue is wet. And we can use this because to look at fluid or look at edema, we just need to use T2, T2 imaging. And we have now started doing that as our initial screening tool for a lot of our patients with right-sided heart failure, right? So we use just T2 imaging, and this is an article that we just published in the Journal of Radiology, where we use T2 to just look at what's going on with the lung lymphatics in our single ventricle patients as they're going through the uh, palliation process. And we characterize the abnormalities that we're seeing based on four types. And the abnormalities are either as a supraclavicular or extending into the mediastinum or extending into the lungs, right? And these kind of findings which are shown over here. So this would be a type three. You can see that there's white in the mediastinum. And this would be a type four. You can see that the lungs are white. And these correlate perfectly with what these patients are going to look like when they go through the Fontan process, right? And that's shown over here. So only the patients who were type four had any of these findings. So mortality, transplant, and TCP takedown, right? All the rest of the people who had type 1 or type 2 abnormality, so basically mean abnormality just po, just over here, did perfectly fine during the Fontan palliation, right? Type 3s will have increased effusions, but will make it through, but type 4s are just not going to make it just like that, okay? And so just T2 imaging, which is two and a half minutes of looking at fluid, is probably the best predictor of what, of which patients are going to easily go through the single ventricle palliation and which ones will not. And this is just the mean duration of effusions. Again, type 4s are higher and mean hospital stay. So everything correlates. And within that group that's type 4, and how do you distinguish between type 3 and type 4? Those are things that we're looking at now. But within that group of type 4, there is a subgroup of patients over there that we are now starting to identify that should never undergo a single ventricle palliation. And we are starting to now do that. If we see a certain finding over there, then we just avert that whole process. We move them towards transplant. 
Within that subgroup, we are now doing more and more interventions on them, and is it possible that we can potentially get them to that point? We don't know. But we had another uh, patient just actually this week with type 4 that came to us, is a gland, and we did an intervention, a selective intervention, uh, and we'll see what happens. We have been able to get some of them through it. So we now screen all of our patients with T2 imaging. They get a pre and P. Fontan uh, screening. Uh, but can we screen them earlier than that, right? Can we screen them as fetuses? Can we screen them when they're newborn? And uh, <clears throat> what should we do as far as surveillance? And can we see other things? Can we screen them for lymphatic abnormalities coming out of their liver? So the answer to this question is yes for probably the fetus and newborn, probably for PLE. And what should we do with post-fertan surveillance? That is out of, that's right now a, a debate that we're having. This is what's called numbing lung. So this is a fetus with lung lymphatic abnormality, uh, abnormalities. Right? So this nutmeg lung is this uh, uh, reticulated pattern, and we know that this correlates what now it used to be called pulmonary lymphangiectasia. Right? And if you're born with this, right, then this is what your lung is going to look like. This is a normal lung. This is a normal septum. This is lymphangiectasia. These are all these dilated lymphatic channels. And if you look at the lung tissue, the it's loaded with fluid, right? So you're not going to survive. If you don't have a functioning lymph system, you can smack babies as much as you want, and they can try to cry, but they will not get the fluid out of their lungs because it's a lymph system that is absorbing that fluid out of there. This is a newborn that is born with a type 4, right? But although we did not classify it for newborns, right? But this is T2 imaging. You can see that there's a whole bunch of fluid inside the lung over here. This is dynamic contrast lymphangiography, and it correlates perfectly one-to-one -one with what's happening over there, right? And this kid is sick as soon as they're born, right? And they're having problems. So moving on from screening to the flow disorders, right? And there's many different kinds, right? There's uh, lymph leaks, and I'll show one example. Uh, those are easy, easy to take care of. You deal with it uh, every so often. You'll have patients that undergo some kind of surgeries and ultimately will develop a chylothorax. It can be uh, significant. Very easy to fix those kind of things, right? The one that we're dealing, and we won't talk too much about lymphedema, what we'll really be talking about is this overproduction and conduction abnormality, right? And this leads to these perfusion abnormalities, and depending on which organ system is abnormally perfused, and you can abnormally perfuse every single organ in your body. It can be the kidneys, and we've seen patients who have very bad kidney dysfunction because of this, uh, lungs, mesentery, anything. And you'll show up with different symptoms depending on what your, where the flow is abnormal. This is, again, this abnormal perfusion of the lungs, this pulmonary lymphatic perfusion. And if you are abnormally perfusing your pleural surface, right, then fluid will start to leak out of there and you'll develop either a chylothorax or a lymphatic effusion or just fluid accumulating in your pleural space. And if you're leaking into your airway, you'll start spilling fluid into there. And this can happen in adults and can be called, it's called chyloptosis sometimes when it gets really bad, or plastic bronchitis, which can always ha also happen in adults. We've classified this uh, based on five types, which is basic, basically classification based on the anatomy, and just recently added another classification where the central lymphatic system is not involved in this abnormal lung perfusion, but it is the liver directly connected to the lungs. And that can happen. That does happen in your patients. There are patients who have liver to lung direct connections, and that can be a little bit of a mess. This is a baby that had nutmeg lung that was right-sided nutmeg lung and is born, you can see, has this abnormal pulmonary perfusion. So this is the intranodal injection. And you can see that the lung is white, right? So this kind of abnormal stuff correlates perfectly with the T2 imaging and correlates with symptoms in these patients. And you can treat this. So you can treat it in babies by uh, just putting a little bit of oil into their lymph nodes, and that will get this to go away. And we have a larger and larger group of uh, patients who now have this. But interestingly enough, if you're a baby born with this, we put a little bit of oil in there, and you're going to go home. And then you're fine. And all of our babies, 100% of them, we get them to go home. But then they're living with this. And then what happens? And they look actually like normal babies. But we have seen now some of them coming back when they're 76 years old and even uh, <clears throat> older than that. And it looks exactly the same. This is 76-year-old with severe idiopathic plaster bronchitis, right? He's living his entire life 
with this, right, this pulmonary perfusion, looks exactly like the babies, and never knew about this, right? He was running, he thought that he was completely normal until he started coughing up these things. Looks exactly like that, again, very treatable. So we, we, we basically cured this in this person. And the cure is exactly the same thing. You just go in there, in this case, we just shut down the duct. You can see that there's a coil in here, and we put glue in here, and, and his plastic bronchitis went away just like that. And he's living a completely normal life right now, right? But again, same disease. So most likely, there are people, sit, maybe people sitting in this room who have this. Maybe this is a normal physiological thing, and there's 10% of the population that have this. And maybe some of them will show up as adults, and some of them won't. We don't 100% know. This entity, which we call <laughs> congenital or central lymphatic flow disorder, is those kind of babies with not just abnormality in their lungs. This is now abnormalities in more than one of the organs. And in babies, organs can be anything, because they can conduct perfectly through their skin. I won't go through this too much, because we're dealing with mostly adults over here. But this is a big problem. Babies showing up like this are like your patients with severe heart failure, who are just accumulating fluid everywhere and you can't get it out of them, right? <clears throat> but there are some things that we're starting to do now. So if a baby comes and has an occluded thoracic duct outlet, we can fix that, right? So we can do lymphovenous anastomosis, and this is what that looks like, right? So we took a baby who had a thoracic duct that was not connected, and we connected it to the external jugular vein, and this works perfectly well for alleviating all these anisarchic and all this kind of stuff, right? It's just reconstituting central lymphatic flow. Babies do get a little bit of blue with the procedures, but they overall do well. This is a baby with anisarca with, again, that problem, right? And as I showed you before, we've started using the techniques that Marlies developed, but just draining them, just drain them outside of their body, right? And you can take a baby that looks like that and shrink it to looking like this. And this process, so this baby was six kilo over here, is four kilos over here, and that took us exactly 12 hours to do that, right? So we lost a third of the body weight without any hemodynamic instability whatsoever, right? You just drain the baby out. Right? And we did this in this baby for about two months, and we've now done it in other babies using different kinds of techniques. The problem is, right, is spilling a liter and a half of fluid or two liters of fluid out of the baby daily ultimately will lead to metabolic problems. So we can't do that all the time, right? But it works. It's a way to at least temporarily salvage them. And when you do that, everything gets better. The respiratory status gets better, and many other things gets better. <clears throat> this is an adult with a heart failure who got a heart transplant, right? This is what an adult heart failure thoracic duct looks like, right? This is the only traumatic leak that I will show, OK? But you can see the thoracic duct is enormous. It's pulsating. Here are the valves. Right? Now, when we say traumatic leak to the thoracic duct, that almost never happens, right? We always used to blame the surgeons for them coming out with a chylothorax after some cardiac surgery. It's almost, it's almost impossible for the surgeon, right, to do anything to the duct because that's posterior to where you're actually doing the surgery, right? You're opening the pericardium in the chest. But in all patients with heart, because the pericardium itself, right, I mean, between the pericardial layers, there's fluid. So there has to be a lymph system that is functioning in the pericardium, and we know that it exists. But these channels will also get dilated. This is a channel connected directly to the pericardium, and that was cut during the procedure, right? And you can see that this adult with heart failure also has these enormous networks in the neck. These are lymphatic capacitors. They're fine. They don't do anything. Uh, but he was actually draining right over here into the vein, right? So shutting down a duct in a patient like this, this patient was leaking eight to nine liters a day, right? So we went in there, and we went into the channel that was coming into the, that was going into the pericardium. We put a coil and a little bit of glue, and within three days, his effusion completely resolved, and he went home, right? So you can selectively shut down some of these things. You don't have to shut down the thoracic duct. It actually doesn't make any sense to shut down the thoracic duct, because that thing is flowing at least eight liters a day, right, if not more than that. And so that can be a significant problem for a patient uh, who just got a heart transplant. 
This is what chylothorax looks like in our patients. I'm not sure that it looks like this in your patients, but at some point we will see. We, should, we need to start looking at them, and we are. Uh, but chylothorax in our patients and plaster bronchitis is all caused by exactly the same thing as, again, this abnormal perfusion. The only difference between these three patients is just the age. One is a gland, two are right-sided, uh, are just fontans. One is presenting with chylothorax, one with plaster bronchitis. And again, the fixing of this can be shutting down central lymph flow that is going towards the lung. And they will tolerate that. We've done that in multiple, multiple patients. Despite having you know, liters and liters of fluid going through the thoracic duct, you just shut it down, and they will find places to decompress. Their tissue in the belly will swell for a little while, and they will get, get an ileus because their uh, gut gets edematous. But eventually, that will go away, and they will do OK. This is our outcomes for chylothorax. Ignore the babies, because uh, initially, the ba when we were doing these babies, we tried to shut down the ducts in them, and they all died because of what we were doing. Uh, so we no longer do that, and now they all survive by doing different kind of things. Uh, but adults or older kids who have chylothoraces, uh, doing these kind of interventions, either selective or not, we can cure chylothorax in 100% of these cases, in all of them. We get them to get out of the hospital. And we don't need surgeries for this or anything. We just do a minimally invasive procedure and get them out. Plasma bronchitis is the reason why I started in all this, right? It's a very bad disease. You probably, most of you maybe won't see it. Some of you might see some adults coming in with this kind of a thing. But this is just spilling lymph fluid into the airway. Lymph fluid has protein in it. When you spill it into the airway, protein will aggregate, right? It denatures and starts to stick. So it's kind of, it's like egg, right? It's like taking egg white and cooking it. It will become rubbery, and, uh, and this is exactly what this is, right? This is fibrinogen and mucin and all kinds of stuff like that in albumin. The good thing about this disease is it used to be deadly, but it no longer. We clearly know that it's lymphatic because we've imaged it, right? So this is what the peribronchial lymphatics look like. So if you inject blue dye in a patient with plaster bronchitis into the thoracic duct, you can see that this is the lymphatic channels. These are these blue lymphatic channels, and this is blue dye spilling into the airway. Right? So there's lymph fluid spilling into the airway, and that's what it looks like. This was the first patient that we ever treated with this disease, and again, we did a very selective procedure. We did not shut down the thoracic duct when we did this. The patient had a channel that was coming off the duct and going and supplying the peribronchial lymphatics on the right side, and we a lot of times see this. Most likely, this is the normal drainage system from the lungs, but it's just flowing in the opposite direction, right? And you can see we put some oil in there, and then we ultimately glued the entrance shut. And this is a kid who was coughing up these casts uh, two to three times a day. He was on palliative care, actually, when we got to us. That was five or okay, close to five years ago, and he has not casted since. And he's playing around uh, and doing soccer and all kinds of stuff. But he was a good heart failure patient. But uh, had an abnormal, abnormality in his lymphatics, and we were able to fix it. This is what our data looks like. So we just uh, uh, summarized the first 70 patients with uh, single ventricle fontans that we've treated with plastic bronchitis. This is what they look like when they come to us. This is what they look like after treatment. So almost all of them are not casting anymore. So really a change in the paradigm of what this disease looks like. In the olden days, kids who had this or adults who had this, it was a very bad problem, and they needed transplant, and it was the, oh my god, disease. We no longer think about transplant is not needed. We haven't transplanted any of these kids other than the ones who have had heart failure. Uh, <clears throat> this is what their respiratory support looks like before we do procedures, and this is what it looks like after. So almost all of them get to a point where they're on room air and, again, doing uh, very well. We have a median follow-up of 19 months, but we're getting longer and longer and longer now, the more and more of these that we do. And their survival curve now looks like the survival curve of what a normal single ventricle Fontan survival curve should look like. This was the old, or this is the historical only survival curve we have for these patients, and it was a 50% mortality within five years. It's worse than some cancers out there. So uh, um, thankfully, that has uh, now changed. And the most important thing is that these kids look like this, and this is what these kids look like now. And the same thing for adults. All the adults that we've done, and we've been doing a, a growing number of adults now, they are coughing all the time. It's a miserable life, right? You're constantly, constantly coughing up these things. And as soon as you intervene on them, it just stops just like that. There is a group of these patients where we've done imaging of their uh, <coughs> central duct, so imaging of the thoracic duct, and we don't see anything. 
And so we've started looking at trying to find out where these problems are coming from, right? And it turns out that the liver, as I said, right, liver to lung can be connected to each other. And we have found these connections that are coming from the liver going directly into the lung. So this is one of these patients. Obviously, is a heart failure patient. You can see he has even an epicardial pacemaker. But you can see the duct here is dilated, uh, somewhat tortuous, but drain perfectly draining into the anatomy vein on the left side, right? In the old days when they used to see this, right, then what they used to do is just do try to do a thoracic ligation or put these patients for a transplant. And that would not do anything for this patient. If anything, that would make this much worse, right? So we went, we knew that these kind of circuits exist. So we went into the liver in these patients and we found a connection from the liver that was connected directly into the uh, right-sided peribronchial lymphatics again. And so we embolized from the liver and the plastic bronchitis immediately went away. Mm -hmm. So these liver lymphatics, again, and our understanding of this is somewhat limited. We still have time, good. It's somewhat limited, right? But there's more and more that we're now learning and more that we need to learn about how this is working. Right? Because this is probably the key to a lot of what you are seeing in your heart failure patients, right? Heart failure patients where the liver gets big, it gets fibrosed, right? Starting to get cirrhosis, is producing enormous amounts of lymph and leads to all kinds of problems, right? And there's several different kinds of abnormalities that can come from abnormal liver lympho. And again, what has allowed us now to see all these things is our ability to now do the intrahepatic dynamic contrast lymphangiography. We can't have leaks that are strictly coming from the liver. This is called liver lymphorrhea. We have seen it, or you can call it whatever you want. These kind of leaks, these, uh, it will show up as ascites. This will not be chylus ascites. This will just be ascites fluid. And we looked at this fluid. Usually the lymphocyte count in this kind of fluid is about 40%. Chylus leaks usually have a lymphocyte count somewhere around 80%, 80 to 90%. This doesn't. Uh, we have seen it in the context of patients who had abdominal surgery, okay, who had heart failure. And when you do abdominal surgery, and if you're next to the pancreas or the duodenum, you will do this, right? Because they're engorged lymph channels over there and they can start leaking. Protein losing enteropathy and ascites, right? Protein losing enteropathy, a big problem for us potentially a big problem for adults with heart failure also. We don't completely understand this, right? But adults with heart failure, right, developing hypoalbuminemia is a big problem. Right? And the mechanism or the pathophysiology for developing hypoalbuminemia in adults with heart failure is not completely understood. If you look at the literature, people talk a lot about, you know, the metabolic problem and that's why they're losing all this albumin. But I'm not sure if that's 100% correct, right? And ascites, again, is a big problem in adults, right? And then there's these liver to lung. We went through that already. This is normal hepatic lymphatic drainage, as far as we can tell, right? So the hepatic uh, <coughs> lymph drains centrally towards the thoracic duct. And there could be other connections. So the, the parts of the lobes of the liver can drain down towards the retroperitoneum and connect to the cisterna chile. And then parts of the liver, people usually say one of the lobes of the liver or the right lobe can drain directly up and connect to the right-sided duct. And we have seen that, but we don't see that in most people. And then there's the duodenum. And unfortunately for, uh, you know, the way anatomy was created, the duodenum sits right next to the liver, right? So it makes perfect sense for the duodenum and the liver lymphatic channels to be interconnected and to drain together towards the uh, thoracic duct, right? So under normal physiological conditions, these two circuits draining together to the channels are just going towards the thoracic duct. There's no problem, right? But when you have high venous pressure, right, things can start to go haywire, right? And they can start to flow in the other direction because there is competition between these two circuits. And this is what ultimately causes protein losing enteropathy in our patients, right? Is that this duodenal circuits start to flow in the opposite direction. Now, when does this process actually happen? Is there an abnormality in the channels that they have a susceptibility to this? We don't 100% know, but we're starting to now see it. But this is intrahepatic lymphangiography in a patient that was losing protein at a very fast pace. And you can see it's quite remarkable because this is an awesome way to do MR enterography, 
right? Because you'll inject contrast into their liver and you are going to completely fill their small intestine and their intestine with contrast, right? So they will all spill in. So this is where the leak is. And we have only seen leaks in these patients in the duodenum. We never see leaks in any other parts of the small bowel, and we never see it in part of the large bowel. And it's always the duodenum that is a problem, and almost all patients, almost 100% of the patients with protein-losing enteropathy will either leak into the duodenum, or they will have very abnormal perfusion of the duodenal wall. And this is what it looks like a little bit on, but you, and clearly you can see that we have injected, right, the fluids in the duct, because here's the thoracic duct, right? This is what thoracic duct will look like in an adult with heart failure, right? It's dilated, it's tortuous, but it is draining here to the left side, okay? But severe protein losing enteropathy. This is what that will look like from the inside. So if you inject blue dye inside the liver <coughs> in your patients uh, with protein losing enteropathy, there, you will see it from inside the duodenum. So when we do these kind of cases, when we're intervening on them, we always have our GI docs because it helps us confirm which are the correct connections that we need to shut down. And uh, we can shut these connections down. We can embolize them. And we use glue to do this. So we inject glue into the liver and shut down the lymphatic system. Here is this thing over here is the gallbladder. So the gallbladder itself has lymphatic channels that surround it. Uh, but what you can see over here is we're looking with the scope. And you can see this blob over here. So what happens at some point is that these, this abnormal perfusion of the duodenal wall ultimately leads to the exact same cascade that we talked about before, right, which is inflammation, edema, <clears throat> and uh, ultimately dysfunction, that ultimately leads to erosion of the duodenal wall, and we see actually holes in there, and we will see the contrast coming in out through these holes, and this is what the glue looks like as it's spilling in through these holes into the duodenal wall, and you can see it, right? And this is the reason why steroids and some of the other treatments that we're doing for these lymphatic dysfunction uh, will also work, right? Because inflammation and all those things is part of this process. This is what it looks like after embolization, right? So this is embolizing. This is our scope again. This is the duodenum. It's right over here. This is the liver lymphatic, so we embolize some of those. And this is the periduodenal lymphatics, and we do embolize uh, some of those, okay? And interesting, and we thought, okay, that we had a good understanding of how, how this works, and I don't have that data yet because we just started doing that. So we now have started doing what's called intramesenteric lymphangiography. So we, you know, the big three uh, streams of lymph flow are the central lymphatic flow, hepatic lymph flow, and intestinal lymph flow. And until now, intestinal lymph flow is an unseen part of this whole system, but we now can access that and we can see it. And interestingly enough is how the intestinal lymph flow actually plugs into this system also and plays a role into that. And maybe, uh, and hopefully soon, we'll have that data out also about how protein losing enteropathy is involved with that. This is what some of these patients look like, okay, again, Patients coming to us, this girl came to us with severe protein losing enteropathy. Her, she was on high, uh, hypertonic uh, saline infusions, con continuous hypertonic saline infusions with a sodium of 120 to 125. Her albumin was one, and she was again on palliative care by the time she got to us. We did one intervention on her, and this is her uh, not too long ago. She always wanted to dance in ballet, and she's doing that now, and her albumin is completely normal, right? But she, and she was not a single ventricle. She was just a protein-losing enteropathy. And we were just on the phone with a uh, co colleagues of us, of ours in Europe, and they were treating an adult heart failure patient with protein-losing enteropathy. So it does occur in your patients, and we don't know the prevalence of how many of those patients that you're treating have these kind of albumin losses, but probably a lot of them. This is what happens to albumin levels when you're doing these kind of treatments, right? In all the patients, when you shut down these connections, these abnormal connections, albumin levels will rise, okay? The problem is, how long does this last, right? And we don't know, right? We don't understand the mechanisms of lymphangiogenesis, right? We do know that these networks, there's millions of, probably millions of channels over there, right? And we're shutting down maybe thousands of them, right? So how does this system reroute? And we do know that lymphangiogenesis does occur. And so will these treatments last? We have one patient now who's two and a half years out of treatment with completely normal albumin off of all supplements, off of steroids. So it can last for at least a while, right? But probably not the, I mean, you know, taking a hammer and just using the hammer to treat everything, you know, just throwing glue at everything doesn't make sense, right? 
And what do you do with patients like this? So this is a patient that came to us, a five-year-old with high plastic left heart, uh, <clears throat> who had every abnormality in the book. This is what we call now complete limb failure. Right? So this patient has, she has effusions on the right side, she has effusions on the left side, but the effusions on both sides are different, right? Because you see that when I'm injecting the contrast, the left side fills with contrast, and the right side doesn't. So when we see this, this is traumatic leak, right? There is pulmonary lymphatic perfusion, and then there is all this mess over here, right? There's abnormal retrograde mesenteric flow. This patient has ascites, protein-losing enteropathy, chylothorax, and a, a pleural effusion on this side, which is not chylus, right? Going in here and embolizing the duct doesn't make a lot of sense, right? It's crazy. And when we did her intrahepatic imaging, she already had the signature for protein-losing enteropathy. We did not know when she came to us, because she was five years old, that she had protein-losing enteropathy. When we saw this signature, uh, we checked her alpha-1 antitrypsin, and it turned out to be positive. Right? And we've done that now in two patients coming to us without known protein-losing enteropathy, where we image the liver lymphatics, we see this, we check them, and they have a positive alpha-1 antitrypsin. So potentially, this is when PLE starts. This is kind of what it looks like. So we did not shut down the duct in her. We did a selective embolization to shut down the leak that she had because there's nothing you're going to do to stop that unless you shut that down. And then we did a different procedure in her. We actually injected blood into her lymphatic channels that were going into the lungs to just selectively show it's kind of like a blood patch. And that helped her chylothorax go away. We kept her thoracic duct intact and just worked with her over a few months and got her effusions to go away. And so she's living out there now. Her PLE is controlled. She doesn't have hypoalbuminemia. She just has a little bit of an elevated alpha-1. But she will come back to us with a problem. She's already having it and sometime in the near future. So what can you do right, to alleviate that problem right, where you don't want to just shut down things? Well, thank again to the work that was done by Marley's Witte a long time ago. And this is work that was done by one of our collaborators. This is Victor Haraska, who used to be in Germany, is now in Wisconsin. And uh, he came up with the notion, basically, he looked at the data that Marley's uh, had for those dogs, where they took the thoracic duct and connected it to the pulmonary veins in dogs who had strictly right-sided heart failure. So their model was uh, tricuspid regurgitation and pulmonary stenosis. And in all those dogs, their symptoms resolved when they took the thoracic duct and connected it to the pulmonary vein, right? Because you're taking the duct from high pressure to a low pressure circuit, right? In our single ventricle patients, we can do that because we always have a low pressure circuit, right? Because all the single ventricle Fontan patients have elevated Fontan pressure, right? And it always has to be four millimeters of mercury higher than the pressure inside the atrium, right? So what Victor did is he took the innominate vein, which has the duct connected to it, right, and just plugged it into the atrial appendage, right? So that takes the thoracic duct. It's kind, it, it does shunt some of the blood, but these patients are anyhow fenestrated, so some of their blood is anyhow shunting across. So we close the fenestrations, and they just take the innominate vein as a shunt. They don't get bluer than what they were, right? But you're taking the duct pressure from a pressure that is the venous pressure to a pressure that is about four millimeters, and in many of these patients, about eight millimeters lower than what their venous pressure looks like. And their symptoms of right-sided failure will go away and very quickly, right? And we have now done this exact same procedure in patients minimally invasively in unique anatomies, but I've also done it now in patients with just regular anatomy. There's a way to do this, right? And again, symptoms of right-sided heart failure. This was one patient who had an LSVC, and we put a covered stent into his LSVC and just punctured directly through the, into the atrium. And we measured the pressure, and we took the pressure from the, in the distal part of the thoracic duct uh, down by about six millimeters of mercury by doing that. And within three days, this was a patient that had severe heart failure. Everything was abnormal, ascites and everything. And within three to four days, everything was gone. And the same thing over here. There's a patient who had a uh, coronary sinus osteoatresia, so we just opened that, right, and put a plug in the innominate vein, and again, everything was gone, right? So this kind of methodology works, but it does have a problem, right, because you are now chronically, right, decompressing their blood also, right? And so over time, they do have a propensity potentially to become bluer, but there's things that you can do to control that. 
The last disease we'll talk about, we'll leave some time for questions, is the ascites and the non ascites, right? And this is the ascites that you guys will be dealing with. This is your patients that are coming in and their belly, and I, you probably, all of you have those, right? They're coming into clinic, and you're constantly poking them and draining them, and no matter what you're doing, you're not getting rid of this, right? And again, there's multiple causes to this, right? Increased CVP has something to do with this, but you all know that increased CVP is not the whole story because, as I said before, you have patients with horrendous CVPs and they don't have this, right? And you have patients who have a CVP of 12 and they have a lot of this, right? And this doesn't correlate, right? I've looked at the adult literature, and by the way, the adult literature for ascites and heart failure is very limited, right? There's not a lot talking about this and how this is working, right? But uh, <clears throat> increased CVP obviously does play a role. Liver cirrhosis and all those things ultimately interconnect to each other. Uh, and what are the treatments for this, right? So right now we either drain them or we give them diuretic, right? But those are very limited in how well they work after a certain period of time, right? Ultimately people will fail. So can we do something to treat it? Obviously we can decompress their system, right? But in an adult who has you know, most adults start with left-sided failure, ultimately leading to right failure. So their left-sided, left atrial pressure is not much lower than their venous pressure, right? There's a little bit of a difference there, and maybe that's enough. But adults, if you take their innominate vein and plug it into their atrium, they're going to be very unhappy with you, right? They don't tolerate being blue very well. Interestingly enough, right, this problem has been thought about, again, by Marley's Witte and her people and her husband uh, 40 years ago, right? And she took animals and looked at what does non societies look like. And if you look at the literature today, not many people have seen this. I don't know how many of you have seen these articles. Uh, but they talked about engorgement of the lymphatic channels, right? And they initially thought that the ascites was caused by abnormality from the liver because the liver was bigger and they knew that liver was producing a lot and they thought that it was going to be li lymph leaking from the liver outside into the uh, <clears throat> abdomen. And they actually didn't see that, but they did see lymph oozing out, just weeping out of the mesentery, right? Because that is a huge surface of lymphatic channels, right? And again, that lymph system is competing with the liver system and with the rest of the systems as they're going up. But she drew these, I mean, back then we didn't have all the fancy stuff that we have today to drew stuff, so they just drew things by hand, but the science was just as good, if not better. And she drew this and right and show that in heart failure, right? You have engorgement of your venous side, so this right heart failure ultimately leads to engorgement of your peripheral bed or peripheral lymphatics and the uh, splanchnic bed. So your intestinal, mesenteric lymphatics. This ultimately leads to edema and leak out of fluid, and that's exactly the fluid that you're accumulating in your belly. In liver cirrhosis, again, and this is th several different kinds, we always talk about liver cirrhosis being the portal hypertension problem, right? And absolutely, right? Again, in the uh, triad of uh, <clears throat> the Starling equation, right, your portal pressure is the, the downstream of the hydrostatic pressure, right? So that does cause, ultimately, ascites in these patients with liver cirrhosis. But they don't have heart failure, right? All of them have absolutely normal venous pressure, or most of them do, right? But they're leaking ascites like crazy. Right? And again, that has to do with this circulation and this circulation and enormous production of lymph from inside the liver that ultimately competes with this. So their ducts are dilated, and they're leaking fluid, kind of like the patients that you're talking about. So this was the old way that we used to think about ascites, right? Was that just weeping out of the liver? And again, when they opened animals with severe heart failure and they just took the liver, and I talked to her about this, and they just put it in a bag to see if it was weeping, nothing was coming out of there. But when they took the mesentery and did that, as I said, they saw fluid coming out of there. So most likely these kind of circuits are the ones that are playing a role in how ascites is occurring in your patients, okay? It is a lymph dysfunction that is leading to that. It's not necessarily just the cardiovascular side. This is a patient that came to us, again, four years old, but he had, again, everything. He, unfortunately, had a Fontan and then flew to Austria, Australia, excuse me, and uh, was leaking about six, seven liters a day. Uh, and we flew him from there directly to our hospital. And he, again, had everything abnormal in him. 
he was leaking so much and his lung function was so bad that as soon as he got to our hospital, we actually took him down in the cath lab and uh, we basically have developed this method to take a fontan down to a gland and you can uh, do it very easily and ultimately started intervening on his lymphatic channels. This was the way to take him down, doesn't matter <coughs> for people over here, but uh, ultimately had to do several procedures. So we started intervening on his lungs. As soon as we took him down, from a fontan to a gland, so now you have high afterload, but low preload on the liver, right? His effusions went from about six liters a day to about half a liter to a liter a day, but didn't completely go away. And we did those interventions to get rid of the pulmonary perfusion, and his effusions went down again, but didn't completely go away. And his problem is that he had ascites also. So he already developed those circuits for ascites. And he continued to have that, and we couldn't get him out of the hospital. So in him, we did ultimately treat the ascites. So what we did is we went in and we isolated the liver from the mesentery. So we went, we found these abnormal retrograde channels. So this is, the liver is upstream over here. This is the mesentery lymphatics. Okay, this is what they look like. And this is nothing. This is just a small cluster of them, right? Mesenteric lymphatic system is enormous, right? It's one of the biggest lymphatic systems in the body. And we did isolate them. We did glue some of these very abnormal retrograde channels. And again, within a few days, his ascites resolved and his effusions completely went away because ascites and lungs are connected to each other, right? There are holes in the diaphragm in many patients, so when you take a deep breath, some of them will have fluid that goes into their lungs by doing that. These kind of treatments we've done now in adults, some adults with ascites, and have seen improvement in their ascites. But again, I don't think that that is the only way to do this, right? Ultimately, the better way is going to find a way to decompress the lymphatic system. And Wendy heard me talk about this uh, a while ago, and we actually do have new ways that we could potentially do this. We can do this very easily, right, in the acute setting, and do this uh, just taking patients and just draining them, just like Marlies did, okay? But there's ways now that we could potentially do this in the long run and help adults who have severe uh, heart failure. But ultimately, this patient did have severe uh, problems on the cardiovascular side and uh, succumb to that at the end. So I think we'll leave a little bit of time for questions. I'll just summarize saying that lymph flow <laughs> disorders are serious, life-threatening. They exist in every single one of your patients who has fluid overload and even those who do not, even though you're not seeing this, right? If you have elevated CVP, right, then many of the things that you're seeing that are occurring that can't be explained just by the cardiovascular side could potentially be explained by what's going on over here. It is the reason why they might have fibrosis in their, in their heart, in their liver, right? It's the reason why they might be developing arrhythmias or all kinds of valve dysfunctions, right? <clears throat> and is definitely the reason why they're developing edema and ascites. Imaging is key first step in diagnosis and to guide how we're gonna treat these things and new lymphatic imaging and treatments are now available. And anybody dealing with heart failure patients has to be able to understand also the lymphatic failure side of this whole thing or else you're never gonna have a complete story. And obviously there's always hope and I'll thank you again for inviting me and uh, it was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, yeah. Yeah. Is that something you do as well? So, yeah, we do, we do, do uh, MRIs. So any patient now in our institute who is getting MRI, as part of our MRI cardiac protocol, they're getting T2 screening. So all the single ventricles are doing that now, and all the heart failure patients are doing that now. So part of the regular cardiac sequences, they're all getting T2 imaging. And to be honest with you, there's no reason not to do that, right? That takes two and a half minutes to do. And the information is much more spectacular than anything else. So they're getting now screened, and we are now starting to look at that data because we have a lot, much larger. We've started to do this in these patients uh, about six years ago. So we have six years' worth of Fontan data and some of the multiple uh, imaging sequences. So absolutely, yes, they should get that. I saw you showed a couple of intracardiac echo images. What do you yeah. see the role of transthoracic echo? Because that's done much more frequently than MRI. Having tried some of those in these Fontan patients, it's really not very easy to see where the thoracic duct comes in. 
with the transthoracic echo. So I, did, I didn't show the pictures here today. So there is a, a really good way, actually, to find where the thoracic duct is coming in, even in the Fontan patients, right? And that's using, have you done contrast uh, ultrasound? Uh, not in our pediatric patients. No? We don't do it routinely for their routine clinic visits and stuff. Mm. We don't, so. Good. So you should, OK? Mm -hmm. So the way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but a really no good way to do it, and again, we're writing that paper up, is in, just inject a little bit of Lumasan into your lymph nodes in the groin, and that will light up the thoracic duct outlet really well. And it takes exactly about half a minute to a minute from injection for the thoracic duct outlet to completely light up. And you'll see it beautifully going right in there. So transthoracic will work. You can do that over here. Again, it's that article by Seeger. You can, but the only problem with that, right, is with the, that kind of echo, you're only seeing the outlet, right? And looking at just the outlet, when all this stuff is going on over here, is not the best, you know, doesn't give you all the information that you're going to need. But you're not using it for routine screening, though, only in patients who are symptomatic? Uh, so, uh, no, actually, we are now starting to do that uh, in patients regularly. Yeah, so all Fontan patients now, when they get echoes, our echo team have just been spending time with us in the lab, and they're going to start to look at the thoracic duct outlet. That's easy in kids. Uh, we haven't done uh, the ultrasound in the lymph nodes down in the echo lab, although it can be done. Uh, but th those who get the contrast injection are those who have some problem. And if we don't get them into the MRI or something, and if we want to see if their thoracic duct outlet is connected, uh, because if they need, for example, a rerouting surgery, Right? You have to know that the thoracic duct there and is connected. Then they will get needles here and they'll get, I mean, it's like an IV. This is nothing. And this access you can very easily do inside the, the echo lab. You don't need anything for this. We, we used to just use fluoro to do this, but you can confirm lymph node uh, access with the ultrasound and contrast and just inject some contrast and you'll see beautifully if things are connected or not. Great, thank you. Yeah. All right, we, we're going to have to wrap up. So you get the last word, Anita. Thanks for a great talk. Um, you mentioned that you know the lymphatic dysfunction that you see in adults with Fontan patients um, is associated with how long they've had their Fontan for, the longer they've had their Fontan um, sure. causes more dysfunction. Do you think it has anything to do with the Fontan subtype that they have? Um, and do you think that the conduit itself or the anatomy of the conduit itself contributes, or is it just a primary lymphatic issue? So it's, so they're all connected, right? Um, the anatomy of the conduit, actually, one of the people over here was the one that, uh, you know, defined that entity, right, is that, is, is the optimization of that conduit, is Yogan Antonantin here from uh, Emory, right, has shown, you know, did all the computational fluid dynamics showing that if your conduit is uh, not optimal, right? You'll have this high power loss, right? Power loss in the fluid dynamic world uh, is translated into pressure, right? And if you have an abnormal power loss, that will translate into higher pressure in your Fontan circuit. That will translate into higher lymph production and, lymph dis and, and worsening lymph dysfunction, right? As far as is Fontan subtype, we don't see a big difference, you know, between any one of these, right? The bigger question is, what is the underlying thing that is allowing some of them, that is causing some of them to develop these horrendous uh, problems, and some of them not? And that's the same question for the adult heart failure world, right? Some of them, with certain CVP, even if it's not horrible, and even with the heart function, right? I mean, some adults with heart function were coming in, you know, whatever. They had their myocardial infarction. Their ejection fraction is 40%. It's been 40 or 30% for the past 10 years. And then all of a sudden, something happens, and they're starting to leak, right? So is there an underlying problem in their lymphatic ducts that is not able to tolerate the increased CBP that ultimately makes them susceptible to these kind of things? And that is something that we're going to have to answer together, right? Because I don't know the answer to that question. All right, thank you again. All right, thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.